Now in our 21st year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide, we are This Week in Amateur Radio. North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1136 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Beginning mid-2021, the FCC will require working email addresses on all applications and correspondence. The Arecibo Observatory instrument platform falls into the iconic dish. We will have all the details. It lives yet again. Radio Shack has been purchased by an online retailer. The ARRL has announced director, vice director, and section manager election results. We will have all the details on that. The Shard Building in London is now visually transmitting Morse code. The U.S. Post Office is suspending international service to select countries due to the pandemic. Have you experienced unusual propagation conditions recently? We had a major solar flare. We will tell you all about it. And a former Google executive has come up with the age when kids are the smartest. We will tell you what it is and what he thinks those kids should be doing in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about how to stay secure on an open Wi-Fi network in your apartment complex. And he will introduce us to something new from Amazon, a mesh network called Sidewalk. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will tell us how prior planning your events will prevent poor performance. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes a look at the state of amateur radio post-World War I, how amateur radio almost became extinct, and how amateurs pioneered the use of the shortwave bands. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, says that tower climbing is all about safety and preventing that sudden stop. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in snowy Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau from historic Armory Square in downtown Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York, where a nor'easter is set to blanket the area with up to two feet of snow in New England, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Troy, New York, where it looks suspiciously like we're about to get up at a foot of snow, I'm Eric Sattel. Kilo Delta 2, Romeo Juliet X-Ray. And from Studio 1 of our Central Florida News Bureau, or what we call Paradise, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from Studio A in our News Bureau near the top of Mount Sequoia, overlooking our fair city, these are the dulcet tones of Will Rogers, K5WLR, Fayetteville, Arkansas. 60 Minutes of Solid Amateur Radio News begins now. Leading off our news this week, amateur radio licensees and candidates will have to provide the FCC with an email address on applications, effective sometime in mid-2021. With more details on this late-breaking story, we go to Steve Ford, WB8IMY, who files this report from League Headquarters. If no email address is included, the FCC may dismiss the application as defective. Under Section 97.21 of the new rules, a person holding a valid amateur radio station license, quote, must apply to the FCC for a modification of the license grant as necessary to show the correct mailing and email addresses, licensee name, club name, licensee trust name, or license custodian name. Close quote. Each license will have to show the grantee's correct name, mailing address, and email address. The rule states, quote, Revocation of the station license or suspension of the operator license may result 
when correspondence from the FCC is returned as undeliverable because the grantee failed to provide the correct email address, unquote. The FCC is fully transitioning to electronic correspondence and will no longer print or provide wireless licenses with hard copy authorizations or registrations by mail. A report in order on completing the transition to electronic filing, licenses and authorizations, and correspondence in the wireless radio services in WT Docket 19212 was adopted on September 16th. The new rules under Section 97.21 and 97.23 will go into effect six months from after publication in the Federal Register, which hasn't happened yet. But the FCC is already strongly encouraging applicants to provide an email address. When an email address is provided, licensees will receive an official electronic copy of their licenses when the application is granted. For a club or military recreation station license, the application must be presented in document form to a club station call sign administrator who must submit the information to the FCC in an electronic batch file. You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. The 900-ton instrument platform of the 305-meter radio telescope at Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico fell some 400 feet Tuesday morning, crashing into the huge, already damaged dish below, the National Science Foundation reported in a December 1st tweet. With more details, we go to Steve Ford, WB8IMY, reporting from League Headquarters. Head of Telescope Operations, Angel Vasquez, WP3R, called December 1st, quote, indeed a sad day, unquote. Vasquez was in the observatory's control room at the time, salvaging important instruments when he heard a loud noise, quote, at around 7.55 a.m., the platform collapsed due to the extra stress on the existing cables because of the main cable failure in November. Strands were starting to pop all weekend long, and it was just a matter of time, unquote. Vasquez says the observatory still has a 12-meter dish that will be used for radio astronomy. The iconic dish served as a backdrop for several science fiction movies. The Arecibo Observatory Amateur Radio Club, KP4AO, is headquartered at the observatory, and several other radio amateurs are employed there in addition to Vasquez. Vasquez went on to say that it came off the easternmost tower and took about 15 seconds. The towers supported the massive instrument platform, which was suspended on cables above the dish. The azimuth arm that housed the dome came off the track, fell into the dish a little north of center, and the triangle was pulled by the other existing cables to the northwestern part of the dish. The tops of the towers broke as well. This was a 900-ton platform, and the dome was smashed like an eggshell. No injuries were reported, the NSF said, adding that it is still assessing the situation. Our top priority is maintaining safety. The calamity not only was a final and fatal blow for the observatory, but for the people of Puerto Rico. On August 10th, an auxiliary cable that helped to support the platform snapped and fell, causing a 100-foot gash in the reflector dish. After an extensive evaluation, the National Science Foundation announced on November 19th that the damaged radio telescope, in service for nearly 60 years, was beyond repair and would be decommissioned due to safety concerns. Arecibo, which, among other accomplishments, had contributed to the observation of black holes, was the second largest radio telescope in the world. Operations at the world-famous observatory had been managed by the University of Central Florida. Engineers were ready to implement emergency structural stabilization of the auxiliary cable system, but while arranging delivery of two replacement cables and two temporary cables, a main cable broke on the same tower on November 6th. Based on the stresses borne by the second broken cable, engineers concluded that the remaining cables were likely weaker than originally projected. Antenna designer and electrical engineer Jim Brakehall, WA3FET, who conducted research at the world-famous facility over more than 45 years, 
told ARRL that his experience with Arecibo began in 1974 when he was a student and he worked on the first HF ionospheric heating design and calibration of the dish for ionospheric research. He also conducted amateur radio moon bounce experiments there. Later he designed feeds for radio astronomy and designed and built the HF ionosphere modification facility that fed the dish with a dipole array at the bottom of the huge dish after Hurricane Georges destroyed the first HF facility some 10 miles away in 1998. I built a super contest station on my farm there about 2 miles away using Angel's call sign WP3R. It got destroyed in Hurricane Maria in 2017, Breakall recounted. I also was on the team for KP4AO in 2010 for EME Moon Bounce, and my photo was on the cover of QST with Joe Taylor, K1JT. I was prepared for this, but still never wanted to hear it, Breakall told ARRL. It is like losing a loved one when you know they are dying. Wow, who would have ever believed it? The National Science Foundation said it was saddened by the latest development regarding the aging radio telescope. As we move forward, we will be looking for ways to assist the scientific community and maintain our strong relationship with the people of Puerto Rico. Vasquez said the observatory still has a 12-meter dish that will be used for radio astronomy, as well as a LIDAR lab and an optical lab with photometers. The site by no means is closed, and it wasn't the intent of the National Science Foundation to close the facility, he said. They did want us to stabilize the platform so it could be lowered safely. He also reported that they are looking into rebuild possibilities. Radio Shack is back as an online retailer of electronics, offering some parts of its inventory that largely consists of radios, batteries, telephone gear, drones, computer accessories, and even cameras. The iconic company was recently purchased from General Wireless by Retail E-Commerce Ventures. No plans are in place to reopen Radio Shack-owned stores, although some 400 brick-and-mortar outlets not affiliated with Retail E-Commerce Ventures are operated by franchisees. Retail E-Commerce Ventures, which specializes in online retail, has previously revamped the Internet presence of such bankrupt businesses as Pier 1 Imports and Dress Barn, according to a news release. During its heyday, Radio Shack had some 8,000 retail stores and once offered some amateur radio equipment, including some popular handheld transceivers and a 10-meter transceiver. Radio Shack came out of its second bankruptcy in January of 2018 with 400 dealers, an online retail presence, and a distribution center. In comments to the FCC, ARRL has argued that radio amateurs should be allowed to continue shared operation in the 3.4 gigahertz band until 5G licensees who purchase the spectrum when the FCC puts it up for auction initiates incompatible operations. In its further notice of proposed rulemaking, the FCC had proposed to sunset the band for amateur radio in two phases, governed by when new licenses are issued rather than when the new licensees begin to use the spectrum. ARRL pointed out that in many geographic areas it could be years before the 3 gigahertz spectrum is actually put into use by commercial users, and they argued that amateur radio should be allowed to continue operations on a secondary, non-interference basis as it has done for decades with federal primary users until new uses actually begin rather than when licenses are issued. The ARRL Dakota Division will have a new director and the Great Lakes and Midwest Divisions will have new vice directors on January 1st. The results of four contested elections for director and vice director in three ARRL divisions were announced on November 20th after ballots were tallied at ARRL headquarters. In the Dakota Division, incumbent Matt Holden, K0BBC, lost his re-election bid to challenger Vernon Bill Lippert, AC0W. The vote was 982 to 485. Holden has served as a director since 2018. In the Great Lakes Division, incumbent director Dale Williams, WA8EFK, retained his seat in the challenge from Michael Calter, W8CI. The vote there was 1,840 to 1,398. 
In a three-way contest for Great Lakes Division Vice Director, Ohio Section Manager Scott Yonnelly, N8SY, received 1,670 votes to outpoll Jim Hessler, K8JH, with 795 votes, and Frank Piper, KI8GW, who received 611 votes. Incumbent Vice Director Tom Delaney, W8WTD, didn't run for another term. In the Midwest Division, Dave Popper, KD2DP, will become the new Vice Director in January. He received 1,164 votes to 623 for the challenger, Lloyd Colston, KC5FM. Declared elected without opposition in the Atlantic Division, Director Tom Abernathy, W3TOM, who's held the seat since 2015, and Vice Director Bob Famiglio, K3RF, were elected to three-year terms from 2015 to 2018 and then appointed in 2019 to fill a vacancy when the incumbent stepped down. In the Dakota Division, Vice Director Lynn Nelson, W0ND, in office since 2018, and in the Delta Division, Director David Norris, K5UZ, served since 2012, and Vice Director Ed Hudgens, WB4RHQ, appointed in 2013. In the Midwest Division, current Vice Director Art Ziegelbaum, K0AIZ, will become the new director in January. He was unopposed to succeed incumbent Rod Bloxham, K0DAS, who's stepping down. Ziegelbaum has been Vice Director since 2014. All newly elected officials take office at noon on January 1, 2021. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. The Gathering will be the theme for the 2021 Dayton Hamvention. Hamvention General Chair Rick Alnett, WSAG, said the theme reflects what has been missing from our lives most of this year. Alnut, a medical doctor with a master's degree in public health, said Hamvention Management is closely following the coronavirus situation and believes it will improve enough by May that government restrictions on travel and large groups will be relaxed. The Hamvention team will continue to follow developments. Hamvention 2021 will be held May 21st through the 23rd at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. New York City, Long Island Section Manager Jim Mezzi, W2KFV, has been re-elected in the fall election cycle. Mezzi of Carl Place received 527 votes to 136 for challenger Don Kazovich, W2BRU. The race for New York City, Long Island Section Manager was the only contested election. Mezzi begins a new two-year term of office on January 1, 2021. He has served as New York City, Long Island section manager since 2013. In the West Central Florida section, Michael Douglas, W4MDD of Wachula, Florida, will become section manager starting on January 1, 2021. He was the only nominee for the post. Douglas is currently affiliated club coordinator, a technical specialist, and an official emergency station. Incumbent West Central Florida section manager Daryl Davis KT4WX did not run for a new term after serving for the past six years. These incumbent section managers were the only candidates for re-election and will begin new terms of office on January 1st. Tom Walsh, K1TW in Eastern Massachusetts, Cecil Higgins, AC0HA in Missouri, Matt Anderson, KA0BOJ in Nebraska, Tom Dick, KF2GC in Northern New York, Mark Tarpley, N4UFP in South Carolina, Tom Pricer, N2XW in Southern New Jersey, and Joe Shupinas, W3BC in Western Pennsylvania. London's tallest building is now transmitting Morse code. Here's the story. The Shard Building, which defines the London skyline, has been the symbol of the city since its completion seven years ago. It recently became transformed into a symbol of gratitude in a way that ham radio operators, more than most people, can comprehend. At 306 meters or 103 feet in height, it's the UK's tallest building, which makes its important message flashing in blue and white LED lights at the very top hard to miss. The 575 lights flash, spelling thank you. Two words directed to the National Health Service workers whose efforts have helped protect the British public since the start of the pandemic. 
City dwellers and visitors have stopped to marvel at the light show since it began on the night of Thursday, November 26th. But even London's tallest building isn't above needing a little help. That help came from the Radio Society of Great Britain. The RSGB stepped in to verify that all those high-profile dits and dahs were indeed being sent correctly, ensuring that the message's delivery enjoyed a towering triumph. Here in the United States, you can see Morse code being sent every night of the year, from the lights atop the Capitol Records building in downtown Los Angeles, sending the word Hollywood from atop its iconic spire. If you are filling out a lot of QSL cards from All That DX you've been working lately, you may want to slow down a bit on a few of them. The U.S. Postal Service has suspended international mail acceptance for certain destinations. Service to Panama, Libya, Madagascar, and Turkmenistan has been halted as a result of foreign postal operator service shutdown. In other locations, including Brunei, Angola, Cuba, Sierra Leone, French Guiana, Mauritius, Yemen, Guadeloupe, and South Sudan, service is suspended temporarily as a result of transportation not being available. This is not a complete list, so please visit the U.S. Postal Service website. Postal officials ask that items addressed to these countries not be mailed. Here's the current listing of upcoming ARRL webinars. You can visit the ARRL Learning Network web page to register for upcoming sessions and to view previously recorded sessions. The schedule is subject to change. Amateur Radio's role at the Boston Marathon Bombing, hosted by Steve Schwarm, W3EVE. Amateur Radio has played a significant role in public service communications for the Boston Marathon for several decades. That role was put to the test in 2013 when two bombs were exploded near the finish line. This presentation will describe the role that ham radio played at the marathon and how that role changed due to the bombing. The webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, December 8, 2020 at 10 p.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, or 1800 UTC. Learn and have fun with Morse Code, co-hosted by Howard Bernstein, WB2UZE, and Jim Kreitz, W6JIM. Morse Code, or CW, is a popular ham radio operating mode. Learning CW does not have to be an arduous or lonely experience. Learn, practice, and enjoy CW with the methods used by the Long Island CW Club. This webinar is scheduled for Thursday, December 17th, 2020 at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, or 0100 UTC on Friday, December 18th. QSLing in an Online World, hosted by Anthony Lusher, K8ZT. Learn all about the changing methods of QSLing in amateur radio, including traditional paper QSL cards and electronic QSLing, such as Logbook of the World and eQSL. This is scheduled for Tuesday, January 5th, 2021 at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, or 1800 UTC. Federal Communications Commission Chairman Ajit Pai, who helped undo net neutrality rules, said he will step down January 20th the day President-elect Joe Biden is inaugurated. It's been an honor of a lifetime to serve at the Federal Communications Commission, including as chairman of the FCC over the past four years, Pai said in a statement issued on Monday. I'm grateful to President Trump for giving me the opportunity to lead the agency in 2017, to President Obama for appointing me as commissioner in 2012, and to Senate Majority Leader McConnell and the Senate for twice confirming me. To be the first Asian American to chair the FCC has been a particular privilege, as I often say, only in America. Pai stepping down would clear Biden to appoint a new chair, which he may do to restore net neutrality rules, which forced the Internet service providers to treat all data the same and not allow them to slow down or speed up traffic to and from websites. Pai served the commission as an appointee of then-President Barack Obama, previous to being named commissioner by President Donald Trump. His term was scheduled to expire in June of 2021. His announcement, made on Monday, November 20th, comes as the FCC reviews its proposal to charge a $50 fee for each application for an amateur radio license. Pi also oversaw the regulation efforts, the merger of T-Mobile and Sprint, and paved the way for cell phone companies to introduce 5G wireless. He also gave the go-ahead to the FCC to begin work on stripping companies like Facebook and Twitter of their Section 230 liability protections for published content. Section 230 shields internet companies from lawsuits about posts by users. The FCC has five members, 
typically three from the party in the White House. The Federal Communications Commission has charged a radio marketer with the sale of six models of mobile and handheld two-way radios that allowed transmission outside authorized frequencies. The November 24th action by the agency's Enforcement Bureau notified Rugged Race Products, also known as Rugged Radios, that the California company must immediately stop selling the radios in the U.S. or face a monetary forfeiture. According to the FCC citation, the agency's inquiry of the company's marketing dates back to its initial contact in August of 2018 in response to complaints. The citation says Rugged Radios acknowledged that it marketed each of the six models identified in the letter of inquiry, dating as far back as February 2014. The citation further says Rugged Radios acknowledged that all six models were sold with the capability of being face programmable to allow a user to enter a new operating frequency and that the associated manufacturer or supplier delivered the radio to the company with this capability. The FCC acknowledges, however, that after the first letter of inquiry, Rugged Radios did take steps to comply with the agency's rules and halted its marketing of four of the six models and later ensured that the new models included the appropriate FCC ID and labeling information. The company also made firmware changes that disabled face programming changes on the two remaining models, but ultimately pulled them from the market as well in May of 2020. The FCC has given the company 30 days to respond to the citation. You're listening to America's premier amateur radio news magazine of the air. This week in amateur radio. The case of the insecure apartment Wi-Fi. Next. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This week in amateur radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You know, Michael lives in an apartment and uh, in an apartment complex where they very kindly uh, supply Wi-Fi to everybody in the apartment complex. But he said, there's a problem. I feel like it might be insecure because it's just Wi-Fi and the login is his apartment number or anybody's apartment number and then the phone number of the front office at the apartment complex. In other words... <laughs> Anybody who lives at this apartment complex knows everybody else's Wi-Fi password and can log in. Furthermore, it wouldn't take a criminal genius to figure this out. And if somebody could drive up to near your apartment, they could easily log into your Wi-Fi. What's the harm in that? Well, there actually, there's a lot of problems here. I guess the Wi-Fi traffic is encrypted because they're using a password. We're going to hope that the people who set this up, and I don't have a huge amount of confidence because this is kind of a goofy setup. Uh, I would hope that the people who set up used WPA2 encryption. So at least you'd need the login to, to get into that network. But once somebody's on your network, they can see you and they, they can see some of what you're doing. And more importantly, they could use that ability to attack you to figure out probe your weaknesses and maybe figure out if there's some way to get stuff off your computer things like that it's a risky situation it's not so very different from being on an open wi-fi at a coffee shop frankly the first thing i would do is go to the front office and say hey can i change my password they may have it uh, default to the office phone number because they assume you're going to change it. So that'd be the first thing I'd say. Can I change my password? Because I'd like to have something a little bit more secure. But even then, you are in effect on the shared network and everybody else in the apartment complex is on the same network as you. If one bad apple lives at your apartment complex, and I bet somebody there's a bad apple, they could do bad things to you. This is why you need your own router. You have to use the router that they provide. You're logging into that when you use your login. But you should have another router in between your computers, your uh, your smartphone, your anything you're using in your apartment on Wi-Fi, between that and the outside world. There are a couple of ways to do this. When I'm on an open Wi-Fi access point, I will generally use a travel router. And that's a little different than using a VPN. The idea of a travel router, a VPN, of course, encrypts your traffic and makes you a little bit harder to attack when you're on a VPN in a, in a coffee shop. Say, a travel router is even more difficult to attack because it's effectively a barrier, a hardware barrier between you and the rest of that network. Travel routers are designed 
to work on Wi-Fi access points, you can log into a captive portal, like at a hotel where you know you have to sign the agreement, say, yeah, I'm only going to use this for the right things, and you put in your hotel room number and your last name. They're designed to be able to log into those, but then to route your traffic through the router. This is this is a, a fairly inexpensive one that I've used. A lot of companies make these. This thing actually has a, a great name. It comes from Wi-Fi Consulting in Washington, D.C., their, their website is tinyhardwarefirewall.com, and they call this one the Kadesh. All of their routers have names after famous military battles. Uh, I don't know why that is, but that's the case. This thing is, is kind of a cool device. Um, as you can see, it has Ethernet ports, and I'll explain why. It can easily be powered via this USB, even directly from your laptop where you can plug it into the wall. That's generally what I'll do. I'll get to the hotel or the cruise ship or the coffee shop, plug it in. I'll log into this via Wi-Fi, and it has a configuration interface that lets me say, here's the access point information. In your case, here's my apartment number and my the phone number of the front office. And then it will log in, use that as its Wi-Fi as its internet connection. And then you can either connect via Ethernet or even by Wi-Fi to this. This is going to provide a barrier. Uh, this company also offers a VPN and even Tor for privacy. So it's really kind of a cool little device. It's about $40 for the hardware. But in order to use this, you have to buy their service. You can buy something similar from companies that don't offer a, a yearly service cost. But tinyhardwarefirewall.com will give you some idea. So that's one way to do it. I'll tell you what Steve Gibson does. This would be a probably for, you know, the problem with something like this is it's designed to be portable, lightweight, low power. As a result, it's maybe not the fastest thing in the world. If you want full throughput, you probably want to look at something like this. This is what Steve Gibson recommends. This is from a company called NetGate, and it's a firewall appliance. It would work best if you had uh, an Ethernet jack in your apartment, you could connect it to. But you can do it with Wi-Fi with a, uh, maybe some additional uh, hardware to you know, give it a Wi-Fi uh, connection. The idea, though, the thing that makes this so cool is it's using an open source router program called PFSense, which is widely considered to be the best security tool out there. Uh, it's open source. It gives you a lot of control. And this device is a little more expensive, but it is a PFSense router that gives you all sorts of firewall protection security. It is really powerful. So this would protect you absolutely against any attacks coming in through the apartment complexes, Wi-Fi, including from your neighbors. Uh, PFSense is really good stuff. Uh, you can even run PFSense off an old computer. So if you have a computer lying around that you're not using, it doesn't have to be particularly powerful. This little appliance device is not. But you could use that computer, put PFSense on it, give that computer access to the apartment complex's Wi-Fi, and then use it to be a router that you log into with all your devices internally. So th this is the easiest solution, this little portable router from Tiny Hardware Firewall. But the SG-1100 firewall appliance from NetGate, uh, maybe a little faster, a little bit more robust, you just leave it plugged in. In a sense, what you're doing is you've got a router in the office complex's front office, the apartment complex's front office, that is your ostensibly your Wi-Fi router when you're logging in. What you'd really like to do is have yet another router in between that and your devices internally. So any router will help you do that. But I think a router with some security features uh, is going to be a great idea. That will let you kind of really eliminate the chance that any neighbors might try to probe your devices, see what you're up to. So there's really three levels. You could start, the simplest, easiest would be use a VPN for sure. Because, you know, pretend you're on an open Wi-Fi access point, you're in a coffee shop. That's the first thing to do. You want to get a little more sophisticated, have a little more control, maybe a little bit more secure, this uh, travel router. And then you want the ultimate situation uh, this is going to be, give you the best possible security. It, uh, be, I mean, this people, uh, I would use this even if you didn't have this crazy situation. <laughs> the SG-1100 firewall appliance running PF sense. It's a great question, Michael. It's an unusual, I would hope, an unusual situation. I think it may be the first thing to do is to talk to the apartment complex and see why they've set it up this way. Maybe they don't even understand that it's 
you know, fundamentally insecure to have a Wi-Fi access password that everybody knows. It would be no different than if I were, you know, use set up my Wi-Fi here in the office with no password. Then somebody parking in our parking lot could get on our Wi-Fi and start to, you know, interact with our computers on the network. You're in that exact same situation. It's as if you don't have a password at all since it's such an easily guessed password. So get some, uh, get some additional protection. Let's start the show talking today about Sidewalk. Because I'm really, I'm of two minds on this thing. This is something Amazon has now introduced and is pushing out to uh, many of the Amazon uh, gizmos and gadgets in your house, like the Amazon Echo and the Ring stuff, the Ring doorbell and the Ring cameras. And it's a really interesting uh, idea. Amazon says, Amazon Sidewalk is a new way to stay connected. Here's the issue. Your Wi-Fi doesn't really go past the house by too much. But wouldn't it be cool if somehow we could put a network, not the cell network, but a network around neighborhoods so that, for instance, if your dog had a tag on it, it would see the tag and be able to locate your dog somewhere in the neighborhood. That'd be kind of cool. Or um, I'm sure there's some other use for it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll think of something. I can think of some ways uh, Amazon would want to use it. So what they're doing is they're putting a little radio. It turns out it's always been there in their devices using a technology we call Bluetooth Low Energy, BLE. It's a 900 megahertz uh, radio. So it goes through walls. It, go, it actually would go pretty well. In fact, they're even selling some stuff designed, I think, more to get the network outside than anything else, like a mailbox sensor. If you have one of those rural route mailboxes, we do. You know, it's not a mail slot in the door, but it's out, you know, in the uh, at the end of the driveway. You could put the sensor on it, and then you get a little chime on your phone when uh, when the mailbox is opened. Oh, you got mail. So you know, but at the same time, when you do that, you may realize, well, that rural route mailbox is down the driveways. It might be too far from the house to get Wi-Fi. Oh, but if you had this kind of low grade network, low power network all over the neighborhood, it would work. That's Amazon Sidewalk. You can get motion alerts from your security cameras, even if your Wi-Fi goes down. You wouldn't get enough bandwidth probably to get video, but you'd at least know there was something going on. Maybe you get an image, still image. Uh, your smart lights at the end of the driveway <laughs> might still be smart. Pets, valuables, lighting. Amazon calls the devices that... It's called a mesh network because it kind of passes it along. As long as one of these devices can see another of these devices, it can pass along the connectivity. It's very low bandwidth, but it does use your network ultimately because at some point, one of those devices has to be connected to your home Wi-Fi. Amazon says, oh, it doesn't use much bandwidth. Uh, oh, just a little bit. <laughs> no more than 500 megabytes a month. No more than that. It's low bandwidth. It's just it's just a little. So I could see the convenience in this. Privacy advocates and people who are just incensed by the idea that Amazon would, without really asking, borrow their network are, are upset. There's a privacy concern, you know. And and of course, Amazon gets some other benefits because I think the real reason is is their trucks and delivery vehicles are driving around, maybe even packages at some point. Uh, you could pinpoint them within this sidewalk network that. If all goes well, and it and it could very well, because a lot of people have Amazon Echoes in their houses, Ring video doorbells or Ring cameras. If it all goes as, according to plan, we could have this Amazon-owned low-power network all over, all over. And, uh, you know, the great benefit for Amazon, I think the, probably the real reason for Amazon is uh, is they know where the delivery trucks are, Right. Well, actually, really, let's think about it. They, UPS and FedEx already have trackers in the trucks. They know exactly where a truck is. In fact, you've probably gotten that text, your package is nine stops away. Your package is eight stops away. That's because they know exactly where it is. So maybe this isn't something of great value. Maybe it's something you could put in a, a package. So you don't want to, that's expensive. These Bluetooth LE devices, these radios, they need power. So you have to put a battery in. Probably, no, you're not going to build that into a package. <sighs> Amazon has a white paper on privacy and security, and they do a lot of the things one would expect. Honestly, if, if privacy concerns you, this is not a big issue compared to the, the fact that you've got an Amazon-powered camera and microphone all over the place, right? And then I'll go straight back to Amazon. 
So this isn't this. I mean, this is just a little low power transmitter. There's some value to it. I'm not. People are upset about it, though. I'm just curious how you feel about it because I, I don't know. You can disable it, and maybe this is what's upsetting to people: is it's on by default. It's it's on automatically right now uh, on your devices. So the way you turn this off, you actually have to do something, and it's not that easy. You go into the Amazon app, the A L E X A. I don't want to say it out loud. I don't want to trigger anybody's device but you know the alexa app on your iphone or your uh, ipad or your android device you have that right and uh as long as it's on the latest version when you click the uh, down the lower right hand corner there's those lines that say more that's what they hide the stuff they don't really think you're ever going to want to see then under more you'll see see more <laughs> and under see more <laughs> you'll see settings and then under settings how many clicks are we now you'll see account settings. Who's counting? Are you counting these? Let's see. One, two, three. Under account settings, you'll see Amazon Sidewalk. That's four clicks. Here, you'll find, in some cases, something that says, coming soon, Amazon Sidewalk. And it'll describe, in a kind of glowing way, Amazon Sidewalk is a shared network that helps devices work better. Sidewalk can help your compatible devices automatically connect or reconnect to your router. It can also extend coverage for Sidewalk-enabled devices such as Ring Smart Lights and Pet and Object Trackers, which so far I don't think Amazon's selling, but maybe at some point they will. So they can stay connected and continue to work longer over longer distances. Sidewalk uses a small portion of a small portion of your internet bandwidth to provide these services to you and your neighbors because you're a good neighbor. Then at the very bottom, there's click, what is it, five, six, to disable. It doesn't say disable. <laughs> it just says Amazon Sidewalk. Then there's a little switch, and then you can turn it off. That's how you turn it off. That is not, on, it's on by default. You, If you have a Sidewalk-enabled device, it's on by default. Now, this is a really, boy, this is going to be a good one for talking about privacy and Amazon and security and all that because... Amazon's designed this, and I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. Amazon's designed this, I think, perfectly well to be secure. You already, if you have an Amazon Echo or a Ring doorbell, you're already giving Amazon access to a microphone, at least, and possibly even a camera that they, they can see. You know, there's a, you, I guess there's switches you can kind of disable some of the features, but if you want to talk to Amazon's Echo and have it respond, you, you've got to send that t conversation back to Amazon where they can see what you're talking about. That's just the way it is. That's how those things work. They're not what we call on-device voice recognition. Uh, the iPhone is, but not Amazon. So you already have made a deal with the devil. This is just a little bit more. That, I don't think it, it really doesn't use a whole lot of bandwidth. Never more than 500 megabytes a month, which seems, I don't know, nowadays that's not much. Seems like a lot, I guess. But, you know, even an app for your iPhone is going to be at least that big. So what's the harm? It's encrypted. Nobody can intercept it. There's not enough data going over it anyway. It's just things like turn on, turn off. I see the dog. They also rotate identifiers every 15 minutes. So people can't, you know, know they can't know exactly who's talking to whom. I guess Amazon must know that. If you want, there's a there's a long, you know, if you go to the Amazon Sidewalk page, you can read the Amazon Sidewalk Privacy and Security White Paper, which if you want, the details is there. Nobody's going to read that. So why did Amazon turn it on by default? Because they know if they didn't, no one would turn it on. And they know that if they don't, most people will just leave it on. You now know how to turn it off. Are you going to run to your Amazon Echo app and turn it off at six steps in? Maybe, maybe not. What do you think? I don't, I, mm -hmm. I understand why people are like, what? And my initial reaction when I first heard about this some months ago was, same, what? But I think it's harmless. And there's certainly benefit if you lose your dog or your keys. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. 
You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. By the time World War I ended in November 1918, almost 5,000 amateurs had served in uniform, with many giving their lives overseas. Amateurs had proven themselves to be invaluable to the war effort. The Army and Navy were faced with an absolute lack of trained radio officers, instructors, operators, and even state-of-the-art equipment. Amateurs stepped in and provided the knowledge, men, and sometimes even the equipment necessary to help win the war. An interesting example of this was the case of Alessandro Fabri, a wealthy yachtsman and radio amateur who had top-notch stations on both his yacht and on Mount Desert Island, Maine. The Navy commandeered the stations, and the yacht, made Fabry an ensign, and placed him in command. Largely with his own money, he expanded his operation and improved his equipment. Fabry's station was used to pass most of the official communications between the battlefronts in Europe and Washington. The traffic often mounted to 20,000 words a day, most of them in cipher. Captain, later Major, Edwin Armstrong, whose regenerative receiver was being used worldwide, was in charge of the Signal Corps' radio laboratory in Paris, where he developed the superheterodyne receiver. Thousands of amateurs served as Navy radio men and Signal Corps operators. It would seem from this information that amateurs had conclusively proven their worth and that the Navy would return the amateurs' frequencies back to them once the war had ended. Sadly, this was not the case. A string of events conspired against the amateur and almost eliminated all privately owned stations. The villain in this play was the Secretary of the Navy, Josephus Daniels, a puritanical landlubber and teetotaler whose opinions often got him into trouble. He was the type of individual that H. L. Mencken and Sinclair Lewis satirized as one who is terrified that somewhere, someone is having fun. For years, he had demanded that the Navy have exclusive control over the radio spectrum. Now, it appeared he had his chance. The effects of the first modern global war, along with the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, had temporarily turned the country extremely conservative. It was in this mindset that the Espionage Act of 1918 and Prohibition were passed. Hundreds of suspected communists and anarchists were deported in the Red Scare. Even the great socialist Eugene V. Debs was imprisoned for disagreeing with the government. Seizing the opportunity, Secretary Daniels urged the passage of legislation giving the Navy a monopoly on radio communications. As a result, the Poindexter Bill was introduced in the Senate and the Alexander Bill in the House. Political observers gave both bills an excellent chance of passing. Back at the ARRL, things looked bleak. All memberships had lapsed, along with all amateur licenses. 80% of the amateurs were still overseas. QST had ceased publication. The unpaid printing bill was now $4,700, and there was just $33 in the Treasury. However, action was needed immediately to defeat these bills. Hiram Percy Maxim and the other board members dug into their own personal funds and sent out a blue card appeal to all known amateurs or their families, asking them to write their congressmen and urge the defeat of the bills. It worked. Thousands of letters poured into Washington from amateurs or, more often than not, their family members asking that amateur radio be saved. Congressmen who opposed a military monopoly of the airwaves also joined in, lending their support to amateur radio. Overwhelmed by this grassroots opposition to naval control of the radio spectrum, Congress killed the bills in committee. This 1919 letter-writing campaign had a profound historical impact on all of radio. For, had these bills passed, not only would amateur radio have disappeared forever, but all private communication activities, including broadcasting, business radio, Citizens Band, GMRS, Cellular, etc., either never would have evolved or would have been delayed by years or even decades. With the bills defeated, Maxim and the ARRL Board of Directors issued $7,500 worth of bonds to league members to get QST going again. At the same time, 
pressure was brought on Washington to lift the radio ban and allow amateurs back on the air. Partial success was achieved on April 12, 1919, when the Navy removed the ban on receiving, but not transmitting. Thousands of amateurs and other listeners removed the seals from their receivers, which had been placed there by a government radio inspector, strung up their antennas, and warmed their filaments with the sounds of the government stations. But they wanted more. Their fingers fondled their telegraph keys as they waited for the lifting of the transmitting ban. Finally, in November 1919, after a joint resolution had been introduced in Congress demanding that the Secretary of the Navy remove restrictions on amateur radio, the transmitting ban was lifted, licenses were reissued, and amateurs were back on the air. Now began the second war, Spark versus CW. Remember that amateurs were allowed in effect just one frequency, 200 meters. A spark station on 200 meters actually generated a signal from 150 to 250 meters. With the sensitive regenerative receivers now in use, the practical range was several hundred miles. Transcontinental relays now took less than five minutes. The number of licensed amateur operators stood at 5,719 in 1920, 10,809 in 1921, and 14,179 in 1922, and all were operating on 200 meters. To quote Arthur Lyle Budlong in The Story of the American Radio Relay League, it was interference. Lord, what interference. It was bedlam. Something had to be done. And it was. Various transatlantic tests were conducted from 1921 through 1923. The results overwhelmingly showed CW was far superior to Spark. Post-war vacuum tube production was at its peak. In 1921, an RCA 5-watt tube cost $8, and as a single-tube CW transmitter, could outperform a 500-watt Spark station. A 50-watt tube cost $30 and was five times more effective than the best 1-kilowatt Spark station. Since CW took only a fraction of the bandwidth that Spark did, over 50 CW stations in the same area could occupy the 150 to 200 meter range versus one Spark station. The transatlantic tests also revealed some other interesting facts. Due to the excessive interference on 200 meters, some stations had dropped down to 100 meters where, to their surprise, they found conditions much better. Throughout the 1922 through 1924 period, Hundreds of tests and casual contacts were made on the 100-meter wavelength, which conclusively showed not only CW's superiority over Spark, but increased range on the shorter wavelengths. Once again, the scientists came forward and said that long distances on 100 meters were mathematically impossible. And once again, the amateurs proved them wrong. During 1924, several CW contacts were made at distances exceeding 6,000 miles. On October 19, 1924, a station in England worked New Zealand, a distance of almost 12,000 miles. Amateur communications had now reached halfway around the world. Although it would take a few years to discover the role that the ionosphere had played in shortwave communications, there is no doubt that amateurs pioneered the use of shortwave. The phenomenal success of CW convinced the vast majority of amateurs to buy that vacuum tube. A few still clung to their spark set, screaming spark forever, but by 1924, spark was almost extinct. The 150 to 200 meter region was now orderly, filled with thousands of CW stations living in peaceful coexistence with each other and the occasional spark renegade. Legally, however, amateurs could not go below 150 meters. True, many were already on 100 meters without a problem, but amateurs wanted a slice of the shortwave spectrum allocated to them. After all, it was amateurs who had discovered the shortwaves. Now, with worldwide interest being shown there, they wanted protection. Negotiations were ongoing with the Department of Commerce to give the amateurs specific frequencies. On July 24, 1924, the Department of Commerce authorized new amateur frequency bands. They were 150 to 200 meters or 1,500 to 2,000 kilocycles, 75 to 80 meters or 3,500 to 4,000 kilocycles, 40 to 43 meters or 7,000 to 7,500 kilocycles, 20 to 22 meters or 
13,600 to 15,000 kilocycles and 4 to 5 meters or 60,000 to 75,000 kilocycles. Except for a portion of the 150 to 200 meter band, Spark was prohibited. Spark would survive in the hands of a few rebels until 1927 when it was banned altogether. CW was here to stay. By January 1925, the 80, 40, and 20 meter bands were filling up with amateurs drawn by the promise of transcontinental Daylight DX. Next time, we will check out an amateur with a call of 8XK and his activities on the night of November 2nd, 1920. In the meantime, take a sip of that Prohibition bootleg gin, check out those new shortwave bands, and join us the next time for the Ancient Amateur Archives. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a stream to your favorite digital device on Spotify, TuneIn.com, Overcast, iHeartMedia, and wherever you download your podcasts. Jock Elliott, KB2GOM, was a segment producer for This Week in Amateur Radio back about seven or eight years ago. As we approach the holiday season, here's a special segment that Jock produced for us back in 1998, and it is still relevant today. Well, it's that time of year again. If you've got a roof-mounted antenna system like I do, you want to make sure that there are little lights that warn of the presence of guy wires and the other stuff that goes with keeping yards of aluminum in the air. Ordinarily, I don't pay much attention to that stuff. I mean, for 11 months of the year, who goes up on my roof? Just me once in a while, and occasionally one of my helpful ham friends. But in December, you see, things change. In December there's the possibility of other rooftop visitors. I may be 52 years old, but I know which side my bread is buttered on and I'm not taking any chances. If the jolly old elf decides to pay me a visit, I want to make sure there's a clear traffic pattern and a safe runway. I don't want to wake up on the 25th and find shreds of red cloth and reindeer fur hanging from the guy wires. No siree. I'm going to make sure those lights are hung by the antenna with care so that St. Nick has no problem getting to my house. And so it is with visions of shiny transceivers dancing in my head that I got to thinking about Christmas presents for hams. Then I got to thinking about presents we could give each other as amateur radio operators, and I've come up with some that are low cost, and there are no payments until June 1999. Sorry, I've heard one too many holiday commercials. The first present that we can give each other is to try to be better operators. And one way to do that is to use a technique called pausing on the key. Put simply, it means when you're operating on an HF band or a local repeater, giving a little extra pause between the end of the last operator's transmission and before you begin yours. Pausing on the key provides a break in the flow of words, a moment or two of silence in which another ham might break in with emergency traffic or with a request to join the conversation. Too often, especially when the subject is really interesting, it's too easy to rush our next transmission so that no one can squeeze a word in edgewise. Pausing on the key makes it easier for the next person to join the fun or pass some vital information. It's a low-cost present, and when you hear a repeater being operated with people pausing on the key, it's very, very classy. Another gift we can give to our hobby would be to spread the word about how neat ham radio is. Consider addressing a group of school kids, a civic organization, or a group of boy or girl scouts. Give them a call. Tell them you're a ham radio operator and you'd love to tell them about amateur radio. Show up with a two-meter rig, a shortwave radio, and a few maps, and you'll soon have them eating out of your hand. A small amount of your time could plant a seed that later could become a proud new ham. I once did a presentation to a den of Cub Scouts. To help them get what goes on with two meters, I had one of the cubs stand on a chair and act as a repeater, relaying messages from me to the rest of the group. They got the concept right away, and then I let them ask questions of a prearranged confederate using my two meter handy talkie and the repeater. To my knowledge, none of them has yet become a ham, but there's still hope. Another present to give is to be an Elmer or mentor for someone who wants to be a ham. It doesn't matter whether they're young or old. 
In fact, I read recently in QST that a gentleman in his late 70s just got his first ham ticket. What matters is if they have an interest in the hobby and you can help, you can provide a great introduction to this wonderful hobby of ours. Another present is the gift of your physical help with another ham's projects. On several occasions, I have been the recipient of help in raising antennas, repairing equipment, and even the loan of equipment. I've got to say that overall, I am impressed with the ham community as being generous of its time, expertise, and treasure. Finally, each of us hams can probably find some way in which we can contribute to the public good. Many hams provide communications for public events, parades, or walkathons. Some run nets. Others produce radio programs. The bottom line, there's a good chance that you can give a gift of yourself through ham radio to the community at large. And when you do, don't be surprised if in the end you find you've received far more than you've given. Until the next time, I hope you and yours enjoy the peace and joy of the holidays. This is Jock Elliott, KB2GOM with the Ben Element. This is W2XBS with a propagation forecast for Friday, December 4th, 2020. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that Sunspot Cycle 25 is now officially one year old and increasing solar activity continues to surprise and amaze. Average daily sunspot numbers more than doubled every week over the past few weeks. Two weeks ago, for example, we reported average daily sunspot numbers of 12. Last week, the average was 27.9. This week, the average daily sunspot number sits at 57.6. In the past week, the highest daily sunspot number was 84 on Sunday, November 29th, and solar flux also peaked that day at 116.3, pushing the week's average solar flux to 108.1, up from 90.1 over the previous seven days and from 79.8 the week prior to that. Geomagnetic indicators were moderate despite several solar flares, including a major solar flare that occurred on November 29th that was the most powerful solar flare and coronal mass ejection in the new cycle so far, a sure sign of increasing activity. It was not Earth-directed, however. The predicted solar flux over the next 45 days is 195, 90, 85, and 80 on December 4th to the 8th. 75 on December 9th to the 11th, 85 on December 12th, 82 on December 13th to the 16th, 85, 90, and 100 on December 17th to the 19th, 105 on December 20 to the 21st, 108 on December 22nd, 110 on December 23rd to the 25th, 115 on December 26th and 27th, 113 on December 28th to the 30th, 110 on December 31st, and 105 and 103 on January 1st and 2nd. Under normal circumstances, you'd expect your 144 megahertz VHF contacts to be within a few hundred kilometers of your station. Occasionally, propagation is enhanced by ionospheric effects, such as, for example, sporadic E, where the E layer briefly becomes reflective to VHF signals. A rarer enhancement is known as transequatorial propagation, TEP. It was first noticed by military radio operators in the 1940s. They discovered that ranges of 3,000 to 5,000 kilometers were being achieved when transmitting across the equator in either direction, and the long paths achieved reached much further than the prevailing propagation predictions would suggest. Although still not fully understood, it is thought that the reason for this effect is abnormal areas of ionization of the atmosphere in equatorial regions. For TEP to be effective, there must be an enhanced bubble of ionization approximately above both the sending and receiving stations. The signal travels through both, thus enhancing the range over the equator. Well, TEP was in evidence recently. There have been some remarkable contacts made on 144 MHz recently via trans-equatorial propagation, or TEP, from the Caribbean to South America. Many of the contacts were in the region of 4,000 to 5,000 kilometers. One of the most impressive was a contact between Etienne, Papa 41 Echo, on the island of Aruba, and Walter, Lima Uniform 2, Echo Papa Oscar, near Buenos Aires, in Argentina, a distance of just over 5,400 kilometers.
Etienne, Papa 41 Echo, managed to complete 33 contacts with Argentine stations on 144 MHz using a combination of single sideband, FM and FT8 modes. One of the trans-equatorial propagation contacts on 2 meters single sideband was with Lima Uniform 3 Foxtrot Charlie India, who was using a vintage Yesu FT780R. That's a transceiver which is almost 40 years old. You can read more information, including videos and log extracts, by going to EI7GL's blog at echoindia7golflima.blogspot.com. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. In amateur satellite news, Bruce Page, KK5DO, reports that Virgin Orbit has announced that the launch window for their Launcher 1 Launch Demo 2 mission opens on December 19th. This launch will carry AMSAT's RAD FXSAT 2 Fox 1E to orbit. RAD FXSAT 2, like RAD FXSAT Fox 1B, now better known as AMSAT Oscar 91, is a partnership opportunity between Vanderbilt University and AMSAT and will carry a similar radiation effects experiment, studying new FinFET technology. RAD FXSAT 2 is the fifth and final Fox 1 satellite built by AMSAT. The RAD FXSAT 2 features a linear transponder upgrade to replace the standard FM transponder in Fox 1A through D. In addition, the uplink and downlink bands are reversed from the previous Fox satellites in a mode VU or mode J configuration using a 2 meter uplink and a 70 centimeter downlink. The downlink features a 1200 baud BPSK telemetry channel to carry the Vanderbilt science data in addition to a 30 kHz wide transponder for amateur radio use. Participation in telemetry collection by as many stations in as many parts of the world as possible is essential as AMSAT engineering looks for successful startup and indications of the general health and function of the satellite as it begins to acclimate to space. AMSAT will send a commemorative 3D printed QSL card to the first station capturing telemetry from RAD FXSAT 2. The telemetry downlink is on 435.750 MHz. The inverting transponder uplink is from 145.860 to 145.890 MHz, and the inverting transponder downlink is from 435.760 to 435.790 MHz. For further information and to download the telemetry software, visit the AMSAT.org website. The launch that will carry AMSAT's RAD FXSAT 2 Fox 1E CubeSat into orbit will likely take place later this month. Virgin Orbit has announced that the launch window for their Launcher 1 Launch Demo 2 mission, which will carry the AMSAT spacecraft into orbit, opens on December 19th. RAD FXSAT 2 is the fifth and final Fox 1 satellite built by AMSAT. Like RAD FXSAT Fox 1B, now AMSAT Oscar 91 RAD FXSAT 2, the RAD FXSAT 2 Fox 1E CubeSat is a partnership opportunity between Vanderbilt University and AMSAT and will carry a similar radiation effects experiment studying new FIN FET technology. The RAD FXSAT 2 spacecraft bus is built on the Fox 1 series but features a linear transponder upgrade to replace the standard FM transponder in the Fox 1A through Fox 1D projects. In addition, the uplink and downlink bands are reversed from the previous Fox satellites in a mode VUJ configuration using a 2 meter uplink and 70 centimeter downlink. The telemetry downlink will be 435.750 MHz. The inverting linear transponder uplink will be 145.860 through 145.890 MHz. The inverting linear transponder downlink will be 435.760 to 435.790 MHz. The telemetry downlink features a 1200 BPS BPSK channel to carry the Vanderbilt science data in addition to a 30 kHz wide transponder for amateur radio use. Telemetry and experiment data can be decoded using Fox Telem version 1.09 or later. 
Participation in telemetry collection by as many stations in as many parts of the world as possible is essential, as AMSAT Engineering looks for successful startup and indications of the general health and function of the satellite as it begins to acclimate to space, AMSAT said in announcing the possible launch window. AMSAT will send a commemorative 3D printed QSL card to the very first station capturing telemetry from Rad FX Sat 2. Foundations of Amateur Radio. The other day I was adding an item to my to-do list. The purpose of this list is to keep track of the things in my life that I'm interested in investigating or need to do or get to finish a project. My to-do list is like those of most of my fellow travellers, unending, unrelenting and never completed. As I tick off a completed item, three more get added and the list grows. Given some spare time, and to be honest who is that, I'm just as likely to find an item on my to-do list that was put there yesterday as an item that was put there 10 years ago. Seriously, as I migrate from platform to platform, my to-do list comes with me and it still has items on it that haven't been done in a decade, let alone describe what project it was for. Of course, I could just delete items older than X, but deciding what X should be is a challenge that I'm not yet willing to attack. Anyway, I was adding an item to the list when I remembered seeing something interesting on the shed wall of a fellow amateur. There were two pieces of printed paper with a list of to-do items on it, looking pretty much like my to-do list, except for one salient detail. Each to-do list was for a different project. At the time I spotted it, I smiled quietly to myself and thought, yep, keeping track is getting harder for everyone. Bubbling away in the back of my mind, this notion of a to-do list for a single project kept nagging at me. Yesterday, it occurred to me why it was nagging. If you have a to-do list for every project, then once the project is done, the to-do list is done. Not only that, the items on a project to-do list don't really grow in the same way as an unconstrained to-do list does. It also has a few other benefits. The sense of satisfaction towards completing a project is amplified as each item is ticked off and ultimately the project is done. I'm sure that project managers already know this, might even have a name and a process for it. No doubt there are aspects that I've not considered, like for example the never-ending range of projects or the trap of a miscellaneous catch-all project, but I'll cross those bridges when I run into them. As of right now, this gives me an improvement on my stifling life to-do list, and it brings great satisfaction when I can tick off a whole project. No doubt you've gotten to this point wondering what this has to do with amateur radio. If it hasn't occurred to you, consider what's involved into setting up a portable power supply for when you activate on a field day. What you need to do to get logging working. What needs to happen to get ready for a contest? What you need to do when you're selecting your next radio? How are you going to prepare for the park activation next week? And so on. If you have insights into this, feel free to get in touch. CQ at VK6FLAB.com is my address. Speaking of me, did you know that Foundations of Amateur Radio is a weekly podcast and that we're up to episode 285? If you haven't already and you're itching to get your hands on even more content, before episode 1, there was another podcast, What Use Is An F Call? It has 206 episodes and other than the name and my youthful self, the content is more amateur radio. If I've done everything right, there won't be much in the way of overlap in those 491 episodes, other than the same unrelenting quest for new and exciting things to do with amateur radio, but then you already knew that. Now, where's my podcast to-do list? Tell you about what uses an F-call. Tick. Tell you that I'm nearly at 500 episodes. Tick. Finish recording this episode. Tick. I'm Ono. Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Pete, Mike Mike Zero Tango Whiskey X-Ray, the founder and CEO of the True Blue DXers Club, wants you to know all about the 2021 Ultra Marathon Bands Alive event. It truly is a marathon, as it runs for the whole of 2021. There are a number of different categories that you can enter. The level of interest and enthusiasm for this initiative has been very high. Pete says that many have written saying that they find the format exciting and they cannot wait for the start of the operations on January the 1st, 2021. Also, the sun seems to be gracing us with a very good start of cycle 25, and this bodes well for good levels of activity next year. Pete asks for your help to raise the profile of this event even further. He said, more people equals more fun equals bands more alive. 
He's also hoping that if large numbers take part, he may be able to secure some sponsorship for the event. You can find out more at www.tbdxc.net forward slash marathon. I'll spell that out phonetically for you, www.tangobravodeltaxraycharlie.net forward slash marathon. There are some introductory videos and the full rules of the Bands Alive DX event. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartMedia, and Spotify. When special event station W4F gets on the air later this month, you can expect to hear operators calling QRZ or CQ from their home stations on all bands and in all modes. But if you can hear them on AM, that's especially significant. The Vienna Wireless Society in Virginia is operating in honor of Reginald Fessenden, whose experiments in wireless telegraphy in the early 20th century led to his development of a way to transmit the human voice by modulating the radio wave's amplitude into the shape of a sound wave. That's the very principle behind AM. On December 23, 1900, the inventor used this technique to transmit a brief voice message between two stations about a mile apart on Cobb Island in the Potomac River in Maryland. Club member Bill Mims, W2WCM, said that the location is just south of the club's QTH, and the time seemed right to mark the 120th anniversary of the transmission. He said the idea was inspired by a recent Monday night VHF net, in which the net control, Nancy, N1GFV, posed a question about the first wireless voice transmission. The idea grew from there. Station W4F will be on the air between the 18th and the 24th of December. There will be a special QSL card for all confirmed contacts. The annual Skywarn Recognition Day takes place on Saturday, December 5th, 1300 to 2300 UTC. Co-sponsored by ARRL and the National Weather Service, Skywarn Recognition Day recognizes radio amateurs for the vital public service they provide during severe weather. Amateur radio operators comprise a large percentage of Skywarn volunteers. Begun in 1999, the event's purpose is to test amateur radio operations and equipment between National Weather Service offices nationwide, and it is open to all stations. Participants exchange signal reports and basic weather information with stations at National Weather Service offices and elsewhere. This year, due to pandemic restrictions, operation from National Weather Service forecast offices is expected to be minimal, so the focus will shift to contacting as many participating trained Skywarn spotters as possible. WX1AW will be on the air for SRD 2020. Volunteers from the ARRL staff will take part from their home stations as WX1AW slash portable. WX1AW will be available on various HF frequencies and modes. As it has done in the past, WX4NHC at the National Hurricane Center will be on the air for Sky One Recognition Day, marking its 22nd year of participation and its 40th year of public service at the National Hurricane Center. A Skywarn Recognition Day Facebook page has been created and will host a variety of live and recorded segments throughout the day. A Skywarn Recognition Day resource page is on the ARRL website. Disappointing news just in from Mike Terry, who informs us that as a result of the prevailing pandemic circumstances, the Grimmerton Foundation and Alexander GVV Friends Association have unfortunately had to cancel the traditional Christmas Eve transmission from SAQ, the long-wave transatlantic wireless telegraphy station built in 1922. The station used Anderson alternator technology, but even as it was being constructed, it was very quickly rendered obsolete by the advent of the vacuum tube, the valve. The station is located at the World Heritage Interactive Exhibition in Varberg, southern Sweden, and it is usually fired up on Christmas Eve on 17.2 kilohertz. Yes, that's kilohertz, not megahertz. In other words, just above the limit of human hearing. The transmission uses Morse code, which often receives reports from all around the world. The organisers say they are sad to have made this decision, but sees it as a necessary measure to protect everyone involved. 
Well, while you're waiting for the next transmission from SAQ, there are several YouTube clips from previous transmissions that you can watch. The organisers hope that Our Old Lady can soon be heard on the air again. The month of December has been designated as YOTA Month. Annual initiative was sponsored by Youngsters on the Air, initially focused on International Amateur Radio Union Region 1, which covers Europe, the Mideast and Africa, with young radio amateurs taking to the air with YOTA suffix call signs. They're calling from Pakistan, Serbia, Iceland, Sweden, Bulgaria, and places beyond. Each team carries the suffix YOTA, along with the hope that their logs will be filled with call signs from around the world. This is a chance to showcase amateur radio for the unlicensed and help those newly licensed to gain confidence. Stations include TF3YOTA in Iceland, DB0YOTA in Germany, GB20YOTA in the UK, and II1YOTA in Italy. You'll hear them on HF, repeaters, and even satellites. Because so many YOTA summer camps were canceled in response to the pandemic, these youngsters are more than eager to put on a show and show what they can do. Support the world's future amateur radio community, and who knows, you may become eligible for a bronze, silver, gold, or platinum award just for working as many YOTA stations as on many bands and modes as you can. Youth on the Air in Region 2, which covers the Americas, is the following step, and K8Y, K80, K8T, and K8A will be on the air from the United States. The overarching idea is to demonstrate amateur radio to youth to encourage them to get licensed and for younger radio amateurs to get active on the ham bands. Produced by amateurs for amateurs and originating from Albany, New York, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. We now have welcome news that Croatia has joined the small number of countries that's allowed operations on the new 40 megahertz 8 meter band. Dragan 9A6W reports that the National Telecom Authorities in Croatia have given him a one-year experimental license to operate from 40.660 to 40.700 MHz in a slice of the spectrum referred to as industrial, scientific, and medical band. Croatia is now the fifth country in which it's possible to operate legally on 40 MHz. Ireland, Slovenia, and South Africa have already allocations on the band, while Lithuania is willing to allocate spot frequencies for experimental purposes. It's hoped that other Croatian stations will follow Dragan's example and apply for permission to operate on this new amateur band. A bit of ham radio-related light entertainment now. There's nothing quite like two old radio hams chewing the fat on a few pet subjects, and we've tracked a couple of them down. Ham Radio Perspectives is a YouTube channel presented by Quinn, Kilo 8, Quebec, Sierra, and Tom, Whiskey Alpha 9, Tango, Delta, Delta. They're both radio amateurs with 50 years of experience. These guys are well worth a look, as they claim to dig deeper into the history of ham radio, looking at what they describe as the intersection between ham radio, history, culture, and technology, up to, as they state, the point at which they no longer know what they're talking about. The latest episode looks at the fascinating history of DXing, from early radio through to the present, with insights about DXers as members of the human hunting and gathering species. Head over to YouTube and type in Ham Radio Perspectives. You'll see a collection of their videos as they take a humorous romp through such subjects as the history of the Ham Radio Shack and the worst HF rigs. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a stream to your favorite digital device on Spotify, TuneIn.com, Overcast, iHeartMedia, and wherever you download your podcasts. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Every year, professional and amateur tower climbers fall to their deaths. In most cases, these accidents were avoidable. Not too long ago, people in my community were shocked when a commercial tower climber fell to his death. According to our local paper, on April 21st, Jerry Trammell, 29 years old, not an amateur, of southern Indiana, fell from an older style microwave reflector tower where he was working with another climber. They were painting the tower. There is no way to prevent all accidents. That's why they call them accidents. As a tower climber, we can reduce them by following some simple safety guidelines. 
No matter if you're climbing up or down, a simple climbing procedure can dramatically reduce the risk of falling. The cost for this added safety is a slower rate of climb. First off, use the proper commercial climbing belt and attachment gear. Secondly, always wear a commercial climbing shoulder harness. Join the harness to your belt. And lastly, use a similar strap from your harness and attach it to the tower, but always to a different placement on the tower from your belt. This way, no matter which one fails, the other one is more than strong enough to hold your weight and that of your gear and cargo. With a dual strap attachment, you can climb up or down with two straps and always be attached to the tower. Using this method, the only thing that can injure you is a total failure of the tower or a near direct lightning strike. This may slow your vertical movement, but ask yourself this question. If I misplace a clamp, can I flap my arms fast enough to slow my fall to a safe speed? Let's review this simple procedure one more time. You will use two climbing straps to attach to the tower. Always clamp these two straps to different places on the tower, never to the same tower part. From a standstill, unhook one strap and step up one or two rungs until the other strap is around your knees. Then clamp the first strap as high as you can reach. Now reach down and unhook the lower strap. Step up until the now higher strap is about knee height and reach up and clamp on with the loose one. By using shoulder harness and waist belts and using this method, you will always be connected to the tower while climbing. Remember to follow the dual attachment safety rule while clamped onto the tower when you intend to let go of the tower and lean fully into your belt. Always clamp onto two different places. When using duplicate strap attachments, you effectively reduce the chances of a fatal fall by nearly half. That's a cheap and cost-effective insurance policy you can write for yourself. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. The Yasmi Foundation has announced the latest recipients of the Yasmi Excellence Award. They are Brett Ruiz, PJ2BR, Elena Ruiz, PJ2ZZ, Bob Wilson, N6TV, Jari Perkiomaki, OH6BG, and Jim Brown, K9YC. The Yasmi Excellence Award recognizes individuals and groups who, through their own service, creativity, effort, and dedication, have made a significant contribution to amateur radio. This may be a technical, operating, or organizational achievement. Brett and Elena Ruiz have been active leaders of the Verona Radio Club, Curaçao's International Amateur Radio Union Member Society, for more than 20 years. Their participation has included technical activities, disaster preparedness and relief, and training of potential radio amateurs. They serve as liaisons to government and international organizations and contribute to important events such as the Global Amateur Radio Emergency Communications Conference and IARU conferences and meetings. Brett Ruiz is also active in long-distance VHF propagation and digital communication. 
Yasmi recognized Bob Wilson and 6TV for his technical support to hundreds of hams through various radio manufacturers, user groups, and logging software communities, and for assistance to reverse beacon network hosts in keeping their equipment configured and running. He also provides invaluable support to traveling hams worldwide. Along with being technically talented, he is exceptionally selfless in using that talent to help others, quick to encourage others in many areas, the Yasmi Foundation said in announcing the awards. Jerry Perkiomaki, OH6BG, has volunteered to support the online VOA CAP software and website for nearly 20 years, making world-class HF propagation prediction and modeling services available to any radio amateur. He believes in teamwork, acknowledging the contributions and ideas from the ham community for further development of the service, but especially from James Watson, M0DNS-HZ1JW, and Juho Gioperi, OH8GLV, Yasmi said. Perkiomaki estimates that VOA CAP online serves thousands of users from more than 100 countries every month, including integration with the DX Summit and Club Log services. He is part of the Radio Arcala OH8X team and acts as a propagation specialist assisting the World Radio Sport Team Championship community, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and others. Jim Brown, K9YC, was cited for his extensive contribution to amateur radio regarding ferrite materials and their use in combating RF interference, feedlight applications, and transformers. His efforts to improve transmitter performance and operating practices are also greatly appreciated, as are the extensive set of personal publications available to the public and performing reviews of technical material for amateur radio publishers, Yasmi said. The Yasmi Excellent Award is in the form of a cash grant and an individually engraved crystal globe. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Former Google CEO Eric Schmidt has launched a quest to find the 100 brightest youngsters around the globe. He went on to say that the magic age for identifying possible wonder kids is 16. The sooner we can get the next generation in charge, given all the errors we have made, the better, Schmidt, who's 65, told Time Magazine. They are generally smarter, more optimistic. They have more energy, too. There's a lot of reasons to turn this thing over to them, added the former tech executive who founded Schmidt Futures with his wife, Wendy, in 2017 to empower talent who wants to work on the hardest problems. Last month, his outfit unveiled Rise in partnership with the Rhodes Trust to canvas the world for its most outstanding teens and to support them through life as they harness their talents to build a better future. The initial class of 100 will be announced in July 2021, according to Time. The question was, what's the lowest age at which we can get a signal for excellence? And all of the anecdotal claims are it's around 16, Schmidt told the magazine. We'll see if it's true or not, but the claim is that you can tell through a series of tests and challenges and so forth who the really exceptional people will be, he said. And exceptional here doesn't mean just math. It means sort of creativity, verbal skills, sort of the kind of skills that are correlative with great impacts, added Schmidt, who is also the chairman of Governor Andrew Cuomo's Reimagine New York Commission, which is working on ways to handle the coronavirus pandemic. There's lots of people who believe that the signal below 15 or 16 is unreliable. There's lots of 12-year-olds who are super impressive, but the consensus is that it's 16, he said. Ask how the first batch of 100 kids gets chosen, Schmidt said. The system is designed so that an individual can nominate themselves, but you can also have someone else nominate you. And I personally prefer the latter because it provides some signaling into the system. But part of the thesis is that there's people sitting in Afghanistan who are the next Einsteins, who if we can get a phone to them, we can communicate with them, and we can identify them, and eventually get them out of Afghanistan and into sort of becoming a research scientist or a great musician, or whatever it is, he said. 
This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on amateur radio repeater systems, streaming on the internet, or on great low-power FM broadcast stations like WGXC-FM, part of the Wave Farm on 90.7 MHz in Akron, New York, serving Greene County and the southern regions of New York's Capital District. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.